It's the middle of July in British Columbia, Canada. There's not a cloud in the sky, but you can't see the sun. But that's because we've got over 180 wildfires burning here, and our skies are filled with smoke. The fight continues. Burnt, burnt down. Homes destroyed, tens of thousands of evacuees on the move. It's one thing when you watch it, it's another thing when you experience it. As BC communities rally to welcome them. Really wanted an opportunity to be able to help out in this terrible disaster. Good evening. Wildfires continue to burn across BC tonight as more evacuees flee their homes, seeking safety away from the flames. We have team coverage of the developing wildfire situation tonight. Our reporters are stationed across the province. Now, these wildfires should be a strong reminder to us that humans exist within systems that are far more powerful than we can control. Things like earthquakes, landslides, Floods and wildfires are all sharp reminders of this fact. And resilience and survival means that we need to be adapting to live with these forces rather than thinking that we can eliminate them. For thousands of years, the indigenous people of North America lived with wildfire in harmony. They used it as a tool to help them. They would set prescribed burns to create habitat and bring food sources closer to their communities. And they would set small, low ground fires that would burn all the brush and grasses off underneath to reduce the risk of a huge catastrophic fire that would threaten their community. And when they'd been in one location for almost too long and the ecosystem was starting to suffer from the human intensity, they would set a fire then and reset the ecosystem because fire is one of nature's way of recovering and restarting. And so indigenous people learned many different ways to work with fire rather than try to eliminate it from their world. And we can learn a lot of lessons from that. In the early 90s, as a young professional forester, we used to use fire to reset the ecosystem after timber harvesting. So we would do a prescribed burn, usually in the fall, on cut, cut block areas that had been harvested. And this helped to mimic the natural processes. It not only got rid of a lot of the extra fuel and slash that made the area dangerous and a fire hazard, but it also released a big flush of nutrients into the soil right when the new forest was starting to grow. So a real nice harmony there. And, help that young forest get established quickly. But we had to stop that practice because the public didn't like the smoke and people were afraid we'd lose too much valuable timber if some of those fires got away. But for thousands of years, the ecosystems of North America have evolved with fire as a very important component of the system. Here in Southern British Columbia, where I live, small frequent ground fires were the norm and they'd burn every three to 15 years and they'd burn off the grasses and the sage and the brush material and, and the dead and down material that had fallen from dead trees in the forest. If you look back at the journals of early explorers like David Thompson, you'll see that they remarked that there was almost no brush in the forests of Southern British Columbia when they were exploring 150 years ago and that's because these small ground fires were there. They were present in the system and they were doing their job of maintaining the existing forest conditions. Dr. Laurie Daniels of the University of British Columbia has recently completed research in the Okanagan looking inside many of the trees, the ponderosa pine and the Douglas fir, and examining the fire scars and understand that there's, it's documented right in those trees, the frequent recurrence of these small fires the trees are well adapted to live through it and so many of those trees have multiple fire scars just a surface touch on the outside of the tree but it didn't kill the tree and it was just part of that natural evolution of the ecosystem however in the last century and in particular in the last half century we've gotten into this mindset that we are going to eliminate fire or at least control it significantly 
and we've gotten really good at it. Right now in British Columbia, fire suppression is very good. We put out 92% of all wildfires within 24 hours. We've reduced the natural fire rate by 85%. So we think that that's really good because we think we've reduced the risk and harm to people's lives and, and our communities, our infrastructure, but it's not the full story. We've actually in many ways made that risk greater. Because we've removed those frequent wildfires, we've allowed the fuel loading to increase dramatically. In the last 60 years, uh, it's really changed a lot because we've been very, very efficient at putting out pretty much every fire that starts. So when you take that increased fuel load and then you combine it with a year like we've had this year where we had a very wet spring and there was a tremendous flush of grass and shrub growth early in the spring and now a very hot summer, you have the conditions where the amount of fuel is very, very high and when fires start, they're very, very difficult to put out and we're really experiencing that this year. We don't have to look too far back in other places to have experienced that as well. Think of the Fort McMurray fire uh, in 2016. Uh, about 10 years ago, the Okanagan Mountain Park fire in near Kelowna. And it seems like almost every year there are massive wildfires in California that are threatening human settlement. Because we've allowed the fuels to build up so much that once these big fires get going, it's extremely difficult to put them out and in fact because the fuel loading is so high we end up getting not normal fire behavior but what fire ecologists call extreme fire behavior where fires are moving across the landscape at incredible speeds and people hardly have time to get out of the way. Now the cost of fighting these fires is quite high. As of 2015 I saw the 10-year average fire suppression costs in British Columbia at $159 million a year. That's a lot of money that we spend chasing these things down. But that's really nothing compared to the losses of personal property that we've experienced in some of these larger fires. In the Fort McMurray fire, the insured losses were over $3.6 billion. That's 22 times the annual fire suppression costs in the entire province of British Columbia. And just last year in California, the Valley and Butte fires resulted in over $1 billion in insured losses to property. If we increased our effort to bring fire back into our system, to use prescribed burns, but also to fire smart our cities and urban areas, to reintroduce these low burning ground fires that take down fuel loads, particularly in dry ecosystems, how much could we reduce the risk and how much could we save in losses? And now we're starting to come to grips with the potential implications of climate change and the cumulative effects of climate change with our forests and grasslands and wildfire are significant. Now a lot of times when we think about the future changes coming with climate change, we think about that two degree target that's been set at the Paris Accord. But the reality is, is that the increase in temperatures are not going to be the same everywhere on Earth. In some places, they're going to be a lot higher. Here in southern British Columbia, fire ecologists are anticipating that the increase in temperature will be 4 degrees by 2080. Now, they've also done the math to figure out what does that mean for wildfire changes. And here's what they found out. By 2080, they're expecting that the average wildfire size is going to double to a size of 190 square kilometers. That will be the average fire. The intensity of fires in the summer is expected to double. The fire season is expected to get 30% longer. Even the Insurance Bureau of Canada has already published their forecast saying that the increase in insured losses by 2050 is expected to be 50% from today. So we're expecting a lot more fire and a lot bigger and more intense fire. So rather than just having to accept that business as usual scenario that's being thrown at us, there are things that we can do. We can change our paradigm and go back and relearn 
the knowledge that indigenous people had and used to survive in harmony with fire for thousands of years. We need to bring it back into the ecosystem. Now we're not going to eliminate it. We're going to have to live with wildfire as part of our world. But there are things that we can do to reduce the risk. I share some of the research that I'm talking about here on my blog at www.ceanalytic.com. Check that out. And also I invite you to listen to episode 8 of the Virtual Time Machine podcast about wildfire and how we can learn to live with it. So that website again, www.ceanalytic.com. See you over there.